right now. Okay, let's go. Got <laughs> All right. Okay, so thank you guys for coming out to uh, the church history class. And so pretty much this is church history one. Usually when you're in seminary, you would do two church history classes, church history one, church history two. I'll explain the difference between the two in a moment. But this first lesson is the introduction. Okay. And so it's, it's really an introduction to church history, but it's going to feel more like an introduction to history. And of course, like if you're Jesse and you're a history teacher and you've got a history degree, this is all going to seem like, okay, this is what we talked about in college. Um, the rest of you, you might not have heard of a lot of this stuff before. And so that's, uh, it's going to be good. It's going to be good for you. And so church history, you know, the first class, church history one, is going to cover from the beginning of the church all the way until the 16th century, which is the 1500s. Now, anybody know what happened in the 16 or 1500s in the 16th century? Reformation. Reformation started with Martin Luther. So that's the second class. The first class is just to get us from the beginning all the way to there. Okay, so that's what we'll be doing. Now, history. What is history? How does it work? Well, many of you guys realize that history is studying the past and events that happened in the past. Now, were you there? No. Was I there? No. So how do we know what happened in the past? Well, one of my professors likened it to a traffic accident. Let's say you have one person going uh, through a green light, and then another person runs a red light, and they crash into each other. But both people say that they had a green light, and it was the other person that ran the red light. How do we find out who's telling the truth? Well, you would interview a bystander. You would look at the police report. And in fact, that's what a judge does. A judge is going to have to, a judge who wasn't there is going to have to take the bystander's report, the police report, and look at any other evidence that's relevant and say, okay, this is how it went down. History is the same thing. We weren't there, but there were people who were there that left us records, or maybe people a few generations later who finally recorded what was being passed on orally but the point is there are records. There's archaeology, there's all that kind of stuff. And so pretty much the idea is using the available evidence, the right interpretive methodology, to try to figure out exactly what happened. Um, so that's how history works. Now, what we're going to talk about today, or tonight, is if I could get through this whole thing, I'll be happy. Um, first, we're going to talk about why study church history. Then we're going to define history. Then we're going to talk about a lot of theoretical stuff theories about history. Then we will move into basic historiography, and then from there we will finish with the nature of church history itself. So again, if I could get through all that, that would be fantastic. It's, it's quite ambitious. So first part, why study church history? Well, number one, most Christians have a historical amnesia. It's that simple. They don't know what happened in church history. In fact, for some, they think church history ended when John finished the book of Revelation and picked back up when Martin Luther nailed some theses to a wall. To them, that's what church history is. And then some people are even lazier than that. They, if you say Martin Luther, they're thinking of Martin Luther King Jr. And so to them, church history is just when they became a Christian. Um, but here's the thing. This has been going on for 2,000 years, okay? We're not the, the first Christians. And so there's a, a big history that we belong to, and it's to our own peril that we have this amnesia. So um, we're definitely going to uh, cure that problem in this class. Um, number two, God is at work in history through providence. Our God is a God who invaded history. He saved us in history. You know, Jesus entered into history as a man. Um, and even before that, God redeemed Israel from Egypt. All this stuff happened in history. So why would we think that God just stops working? If we're his church and Jesus is building his church and he's poured his Holy Spirit out upon his people, and this has been happening for 2,000 years, you don't think that God's working in that? You don't think he's providentially leading uh, the history of his people to bring us to uh, the culminating point of where it's all supposed to go? Of course he is, right? So when you study church history, you see God's work at it, right? We see God in scripture, but we also can see him in history and his working hand. Number three, Jesus promised to build his church. Church history shows you how he did it throughout time and how sometimes he had to take a wrecking ball to it and, you know, to certain parts of it and to rebuild. But it gives you the general story of how he has been building for 2,000 years. 
If you were to jump in a time machine and go back to the very first day of the church and the very first worship service, it looks nothing like what you're used to. Okay, it's in one city with 120 people speaking Hebrew, you know, and, and, and all that stuff. But now you could go to almost any country of the world and there's churches. It's all good. How's it going? Uh, any country of the world, there, there's churches. Um, so again, how do we get there? How did Jesus build it? Okay. Number four, this is your history. If you're a Christian, this is your history. And isn't it weird when people don't even know their own history? You know, like, oh, you watch those videos where people go on the street and start interviewing average Americans about history and they don't know anything. It's kind of annoying, right? Well, it's the same thing with Christians. If they don't know anything about our history, who's who, where these ideas come from, it's not good. This is your history. Own your history. But the only way you could own your history is if you know your history. Number five, sound doctrine has been guarded and passed down throughout history. How many of you would be surprised to find out that the word Trinity is not in the Bible? Okay, but the Trinity is biblical. It's just that word's not there. Who came up with that word? A guy named Tertullian. Who's Tertullian? Why is he important? Those are things, you know, that we're going to talk about. Furthermore, like how was the Trinity articulated? Why was it articulated the way it was throughout church history? Where did we get our creeds, like the, uh, the Nicene Creed that really uh, articulates the Trinity in a very strong, good way for us? It was through the historical process, right? What was happening in history with the church. And so sound doctrine throughout the ages has been passed down through history and through the work of the church. Now, bad doctrine has been passed down through history as well. And that's why we still affirm sola scriptura. The final authority is the Bible. Otherwise, who are you going to listen to? The Greek Orthodox, the Roman Catholics, the Coptics, the Lutherans. Yeah, error, errors have been passed down, uh, doctrinal errors, right? And so we use the scripture to correct them. But there's also been a lot of sound doctrine that's been passed down and guarded. And so it's very interesting to see how the church has done that. Number six, related to that, it assists in apologetics. Apologetics refers to the defense of the faith. Do you think we are the first generation that has had to defend Christianity from critics? No. And in fact, if you were to look at the historic creeds of our faith, all of them were developed in response to heresy. They were all developed in part as apologetics. Okay? So knowing church history, yeah, you guys can just go on by. Yeah. Knowing church history actually assists your apologetics because I'm going to tell you something. Most of these heretics that knock on your door are just recapitulating an old heresy that's already been dealt with. So to know how our ancient brothers and sisters dealt with it will help you to deal with it when they knock on your door, even if they have nice smiles on their face. You know, the wrong thing is to turn your sprinklers on because that's not loving your neighbor like you love yourself but you should be able to correct them and understand the nature of these heresies. Number seven, we can learn much from faithful examples from the past. Think of all of Hebrews 11. What the author is doing is listing all these people in history within the Old Testament and how their faithful example should spur us on uh, to good living. You don't have to stop with Hebrews 11. You could look at the faithful saints throughout time. You could read good biographies. I would recommend that you read good Christian biographies. Um, if you read one per year, you will be edified. Um, I could tell you some of the books that have impacted me the most was a biography about George Mueller, another one by Adoniah Judson, um, you know, another one about Augustine. Um, reading biographies is very helpful because we see how our faithful brothers of the past, how they did it. And if it's a good biography, you see where they messed up as well. And you're like, ah, oh, they're flesh and blood just like me. Um, so we could definitely learn from their faithful examples. Um, and then related to that, we could learn from their unfaithful examples. Number eight, uh, it, church hasn't always done things right. There's been a lot of failures we can learn from it. Let's take American Christianity. How in the world did they sign off on chattel race-based slavery where they would literally like separate families for profit? Oh, you're married. We don't care. We're selling the wife. You know, like seriously, they read the same Bible we read. Yet yeah, they aired. They aired big time. Okay. Martin Luther loved the guy, but man, one of the last things he did was rail against the Jews before he died. And then Hitler took one of Martin Luther's famous things and used it as one of his main quotes to justify the Nuremberg laws. 
you know, that first started uh, um, the persecution of the Jews in Germany. So there have been some big failures from some of the big heroes. And, and the fact is we can learn from that so we don't repeat those mistakes. And I'm pretty sure future generations, if the Lord tarries, is going to look at our generation of Christians and see some of our blemishes. And hopefully they'll learn from our mistakes as well as we're trying to learn from the mistakes of those who've come before us. Um, number nine. Church history shows us how good we have it compared to our brethren of the past. How many of you have a Bible in a language you can read? Everybody's hand should go up. If we went back 500 years and I asked that question, no hands would go up unless you spoke Latin. Okay? And I don't know if you realize this, but to get the Bible in English cost a lot of people's lives. It, you know, it was a capital offense to translate the Bible into the common people's language. So Luther took his life in his own hands by making a German Bible. Calvin took his life in his own hands by making a French Bible. Tyndale made our first English Bible. Well, supposedly the Lollards did before that. It's not supposedly they did, but it wasn't a real translation, but I'm not going to go into those weeds. Tyndale gave us the first real English translation of the Bible. He was strangled for it by order of the king, uh, by the king of England. And so... I mean, the fact that we have Bibles in our own language, a bunch of translations, we have computer programs. I remember when I was in my uh, chaplain training in the army, so you got a bunch of theologians together, and I made this Russian Orthodox guy mad because his patron saint was uh, John Chrysostom, a uh, fourth century, or no, yeah, fifth century uh, preacher. And I, he said, well, John Chrysostom disagrees with your interpretation on this verse. And I said, I know more than Chrysostom. And so he looked like he wanted to kill me. Like, how dare I say that? And off the top of my head, do, did I know more than Chrysostom? No. But I responded saying, I have a program called Logos, where with the touch of a button, it will compile literally thousands upon thousands of pages throughout all of church history at my fingertips and even sort it for me. John Chrysostom had candlelight and some scrolls and whatever he could fit in his house. What we have available to us just, it's amazing. And yet we're some of the most biblically illiterate people in the world, which just makes no sense. Okay. So when you study church history, you realize how good you have it, especially when you see how much they did with how little they have. If you ever like read somebody like Augustine and you read City of God or you read his confessions, you're like, he's quoting scripture off memory. And he's quoting scripture from all over the Bible off memory. Um, Gregory, uh, Gregory of Nazianzus did the same thing. When I read his theological or orations, I'm like, he had to have done this all off the top of his head. I mean, it blows away what most of us could do today. And yet we have all this technology, right? So we've got no excuse. And I think uh, future generations are going to look at us in one sense because we're the first ones to enter into the information age. So they're going to see how we handled that. Um, and then the final why study church history is it shows us our own place in its history. Okay, even though we're studying all these eras and people of the past, guess what? We are an era as well. And somebody's going to be studying us. And somebody's going to be looking at what we did right and what we did wrong. They're going to see the battles that our generation deals with. So, like, when I think of the people I look up to, like R.C. Sprawl, John MacArthur, John Piper, what were the battles of their day? I mean, most of them are still alive not much longer, but what were their big battles? The battle for inerrancy, um, the battle against liberalism, the battle against, I would say, charismatic chaos. Um, what are our battles? Um, you got things like social justice, um, which by the way, social justice in and of itself isn't bad, but when it's tainted with Marxism, that's the big, one of the big things the church is dealing with. We're dealing with the, um, the sexual abuse crisis in all denominations. Um, it is really like <laughs> it's coming to a head in that. Um, and it's about time that a lot of this stuff is being exposed so that churches, are we going to handle this right? Are we going to do what's been done forever where stuff gets covered up and brushed under the rug, right? Future generations are going to look at what we did with that. We're the first ones to enter into the, the, the uh, social media age. They're going to look at how we handled ourselves in social media. And boy, if they end up with a permanent transcript of Twitter, we are not going to look good. Um, Christian Twitter is a very toxic place. Um, so, again, we have our own place in history, and future generations will be looking at us. Unless we're the last generation, then we don't have to worry. But anyhow, there's no, we, there's no knowing that. Okay, so that gives you the why study history, those 10 reasons why we should know church history. Now, I would like to go over the definition of history. 
If I were to say what's history, most of you would say, well, it's just the past. And it's kind of true, but it's not as simple of an answer as that. Because if you're going to define history, you have to define all these other things, right? You have to define like, okay, do individuals move history or is it moved by impersonal forces like economics and geography and stuff like that? Is it a science or an art? And then you might say, well, what's the difference between a science and an art? And if you don't know, then you got to go look that up, right? Is history just a, a baloney story written by the winners? That's what Napoleon said. It's written by the winners and it's just, um, it's just a tale. It's propaganda. Um, or is it the real deal? Is history based on facts? And if it is, do the facts speak for themselves? A lot of people act like facts could speak for themselves, but last time I checked, facts don't have mouths. So people speak for them. Are people unbiased? Are people actually neutral? Nobody's really unbiased, okay? So again, is history objective or subjective? Do you even know the difference between those? Objective is the idea that there's this true history, almost as if it's handed down from heaven, and, and you know it, it is what it is, and you just either accept it or reject it. Subjective is the idea that, no, we don't have the history like that. It's really in the eye of the beholder. Which is it? Or is it somewhere between those two? Right? And so that's, uh, those are some of the questions we have to deal with. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with questions. Okay? Sometimes people act like, to even ask these questions, you sound like a liberal. Listen, first, I'm not a liberal. Second, God gave us an intellect, right? Christ invited Thomas to in, you know, investigate him. Come see. See that it is me. Put your hand in my side, right? It's okay to ask the questions. God's not afraid of questions, and the truth has nothing to fear from this. And so just know that when people kind of get freaked out because you're asking questions, it's because they're toting the party line, you know? You can't go against the party, whatever their party might be. But the bottom line is, if, we're, if our party is the truth, we don't got to worry about questions. Now, our English word history comes from the Greek word historia, and the word historia just means inquiry. So history at its basic level is an inquiry or a question of what happened in the past. Okay? And in the ancient world, it was based off oral tradition and some written sources. Now, history got an upgrade during the Renaissance. You guys have all heard of the Renaissance. You're probably thinking of the Renaissance mainly in terms of art. And there was, it was an artistic movement, but it was an intellectual movement as well. It was a linguistic move, it, movement. It was an ar uh, architecture movement, all that stuff. And so in terms of, uh, of the intellectual side in the Renaissance, you had this thing called humanism, which is not the same as humanism today. Humanism today is just atheism under a different name. Humanism back then was um, the dedication to finding and discovering ancient documents and translating them from their original languages to current language to try to figure out what happened in the past. So that's why I'm saying it was an upgrade. They actually used critical methods to make their questioning of the past better. For example, there was a, a, a Renaissance artist named Lorenzo Valla. He was actually one of the Pope's uh, scribes. And he discovered that there was this 700-year-old forgery, right, that the Popes had been pushing on people for a long time, since around the year... Um, roughly around 700, and, uh, or no, even before that, between the 6 and 700s, some pope claimed that, that um, Constantine deeded like all of Italy to the papacy and had this document. Lorenzo Valla looked at that document and said, wait a second, this can't be true because in the time of Constantine, Latin was not infiltrated by the Goths yet, yet this document, half its words are Gothic. In fact, these are words that you start seeing pop into European vernacular, oh, let's see, three, four, five hundred years later, right? And so he was able to prove that the Pope's whole claim to owning Italy was all based on a lie. That's some good stuff. That's why I'm saying that's an upgrade. Um, he was very careful about how he said it since he worked for the Pope. <laughs> that could have got him killed. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so that's an example of how Renaissance humanism was an upgrade to history. Now, a big breakthrough came in the 19th century when people tried to treat history more scientific. They would use the scientific method, which, by the way, doesn't really work with history, but it did help because what they would do is they would take theories like economics, sociology, psychology, archaeology, anthropology, whatever they could figure out from those, and try to say, can this tell us something about history? For example, how many of you have heard of the Black Death? Okay, 
the bubonic plague. It wiped out almost half of the world's population. In Europe, it wiped out between one-third and one-half of the population. But you know what particular group of people survived a lot? People who had O-positive blood type. Now, they didn't know anything about blood types back then. But that's the type of thing that modern methods, you know, where, hey, if we apply what we've learned from science back to what we know back then, we can figure out why certain populations did better. And there's a reason. So let me explain this, actually, on top of that. People blame the Jews for the Black Death. They blame us for everything. There's a lot of Jews who have O-positive blood. I have O-positive blood, right? And so nobody better be stealing my identity. Any, anyhow, so the thing is, a lot of us survived. So people are like, oh, they must be the ones who are causing this. And so they even the score by killing us, right? It had nothing to do with us. It was just blood type, right? So my point is a lot of that stuff really helped. Understanding the, the 10 principles of economics helps you look back at Martin Luther's time and understand why the peasants revolted. It wasn't all theological. A lot of it was economic, right? Or you can look at the Jewish historian Josephus. He wrote a lot of good stuff uh, about the first century that was happening in Israel. But if he would have known what we know about economics, maybe some of his conclusions would have been different. So history, again, got another upgrade. I would say the problem is, though, historians got cocky and started overestimating what they could know because these breakthroughs really made them overconfident. And now we're on the other side of that where a lot of historians are saying, actually, we probably can't know anything. And so they're going to the opposite side. Um, that's why if you read some historians in the 1800s, they sound like some of the most arrogant, like, confident for sure people in the world and then you read some historians today and they almost sound like they're afraid to state anything with certainty and so you don't want to fall on either of those extremes um, point is uh, our our understanding of history has grown so with all that let me give an expanded definition it's a branch of knowledge that analyzes or records and analyzes past events now you have to know what analysis means okay Analysis is where you take a big idea and you break it into its little parts and try to understand them and the why and the how and all that of the little parts. Then you try to put it back together. OK, like I know how to I know how my car works in the sense that I hit a button and it turns on and I press a pedal and it goes. But I can't tell you what part of the engine does what and why it works. If I wanted to, I'd have to take that thing apart. I'd have to buy some books on my particular car and understand what each part is, what it does, and then I could put it back together. And now when I'm pressing that pedal, I know a million more things rather than, oh, I'm just going forward, okay? It's the same thing with history. You break these things apart into their small little parts and, and, and then put it back together, you'll have a good idea of what's, what's happening in the past. Um, so history, it's usually chronological, you know, Ask the history teacher here. It doesn't really work when you try to teach it in a non-chronological way. When I first became a history teacher, they uh, encouraged that. Why not teach it by themes? Everybody who tried it blew up in their face because history moves on a timeline. It's chronological. So you take things in order. And history is always going to have an expl explanation or commentary. Okay? You know, your elementary teacher might have told you it's who, what, when, where. But actually, the how and why is what real history is, right? Uh, it's not that Hitler, you know, started World War II and killed a bunch of people. It's how and why did this happen? What enabled it to happen? What could have stopped it? What finally led to it being stopped? That's where you see history books this thick. The who, what, when, and where you could answer in a paragraph. Really, the importance of history is the explanation and the commentary. And so while we're going through church history, in this course, it's mainly going to be explanation and commentary, just to let you know. Um, and that's what makes it interesting. It's the story of it. So with that, okay, um, we're going to move on. Um, and so that is the definition of history. Now I want to move to theories about history. This is where we get a little theoretical because you might think, well, what do you mean theories about history? Isn't history just what you said there? Well, that's what it is, but then you have to, there's going to be philosophies that kind of undergird that, and they're going to color how people look at history. You know, we all have uh, lenses, like glasses, invisible ones attached to our face, and those glasses are how we interpret everything around us. Um, and so it's the same thing with history. So I'm going to discuss quickly cyclical, linear, progressive, and conflict history, 
And then we're going to go into some of the more modern positions, geographical determinism, economic determinism, biographical determinism, and theological determinism. And then at the end of that, you'll be like, okay, now I get these snooty theories about history. So let me start with cyclical history. How many of you have ever heard the statement that, uh, the, that history repeats itself? It doesn't. But people say that because it looks like patterns in history repeat itself. If history repeated itself, then the same thing would happen again, meaning George Washington would lead us all over again in a new revolution. George Washington's dead. We're free from England. So history doesn't repeat itself, but patterns do. And so because of that, bless you, uh, because of that, people thought, you know what? History moves in cycles repetitive cycles. And so they say, well, look at nature. You have birth, you have growth, you have maturity, you have decay, and you have death. Those are the five stages. So they'll say, look at any society or any event or any concept, and you'll, it'll have a birth, it'll have growth, it'll reach its zenith, it'll start to fall apart, and then it'll die, and then it'll start all over again somewhere else. And it does seem like history works that way sometimes. And so, again, theorists apply it to nations, economies, institutions. Um, now, where did this come from? It came out of paganism because paganism assumed the universe has always existed and that it's just going to continue in this, this cycle that happens over and over again. They would look at uh, our seasons. You got the, the spring, the summer, the fall, the winter, and then it starts all over again. Therefore, they would say this must be reality. Therefore, history has to work this way. Now, most scholars aren't pagans today. You don't really have like, you know, the high priest of the Celts, you know, being the lead PhD historical scholar at Oxford, right? Usually these people tend to be um, secularist, and so they reject the paganism, and you don't have a lot of people holding the cyclical history anymore. But there was a notable guy in the 20th century named Spengler who uh, took a piece of cyclical history and called it decline theory. And the idea is it might not work exactly like this, but what he said is everything declines. Everything does. And so you might look at America and say, hey, right after World War II was our heyday. And then you look at us now, inflation, and, you know, we could barely beat terrorists sometimes. And you're like, okay, we're in the decline phase. I hope not. But that would be uh, taking Spengler's um, theory and applying it to us. And some would look at the church that way. Started off like the Catholics would say that the 1200s was the zenith. And then the Reformation came along after that, and everything has just been downhill from there. It's decline in their view, right? Um, now, obviously, we don't hold that. Um, but let me uh, diagram cyclical history, and please don't laugh at my drawing skills, okay? I ended up uh, having this built into this. I'm going to pretend that I'm drawing it. I already pre-drew this. This is my drawing. It's that bad. And when I was a high school teacher, that is what it looked like when I drew on the board. So it's a circle with arrows, you know, that represent the, the, the birth, the growth, the maturity, you know, the death. I left a couple out. And, and then the, these little swirlies down here, what they represent is once one institution or person or whatever goes through the cycle and dies, it passes on to another one. And so it just keeps going and going. Now, a different theory, and this came with the Judeo-Christian uh, worldview, was linear history. And this is what I hold to. I think it's, history is obviously linear. It comes primarily from the Bible. And the reason why history would have to be linear is because time has not always existed. Time had a beginning. Even the atheists agree on that, that the universe, a steady state model of the universe has been rejected. There is a beginning of time. There's a, a time point zero, and then all of a sudden time starts. Okay? And when does history happen? In time. If something has a beginning, it can't be a circle. And yet cyclical requires it to be a circle. So instead it's linear. And of course we, we have the, the opening words of the Bible that establish linear history, okay? And so it's, it's Bereshit bara Elohim et hashamayim va'et ha'aretz. That is what that says in Hebrew. And I know you all know what that means. If you don't, get out. No, I'm just kidding. It's in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. There was a beginning. Okay, there was a beginning of the heavens and the earth history happens in this heavens and earth that was that was created and so since time has a beginning it must flow in a straight line rather than an infinite circle and therefore history exists in time it must also be linear so history like the universe it's not self-regulating didn't get here on its own 
and, and therefore it is under providential control. Baked in to linear history is the idea that it's not random, that it's going somewhere. If somebody started it, that same person's going to finish it, and, and it's moving in a, a, in a set direction. Now, this drawing was a lot easier to do. Still looks sloppy. Here it comes. Met my mental powers now. I would like to say one day they'll get better, but they won't. I'm 44 years old. They're not getting any better. Um, the next model is progressive history. This, it kind of takes the idea of linear history. It assumes that there was a beginning and that there was a God, but it's a different kind of God and an impersonal God that created the clock, wound it up, and now he doesn't care what happens. And so he disappears from it. And so God's not the center of progressive history. Instead, humanity is the center of it. We are the center of truth. We're the center of knowledge. Man can perfect himself. And so they would see history as a line, but not a straight line, a line that's going up. It's progressing. It's getting better. And who's making it better? We're making it better. Okay, and so this, this became like really popular in the 1800s, which is the 19th century. And there were big breakthroughs then. You know, we had the Industrial Revolution, we had the railroads, all of a sudden people could travel all over the world a lot easier. Um, certain medications were coming into existence, and so pe and our knowledge as, a, as, as humanity was growing, at least in the West. And so the assumption was today is better than yesterday, tomorrow is going to be better than today, and it's just going to be an inevitable, cline, in uh, inevitable incline until we create a utopia, a perfect society, and we'll do it. We don't need God. It's all based on human knowledge, human reasoning, and, and all that kind of stuff. And so it's no accident that Darwinism became a thing when this was the view of history. This was just the next stage. They're like, oh, there's a scientific explanation for this. That we started out as little, like, you know, we were reformed pond scum, in a sense, that, that became a, a little single-celled organism, and then over billions of years evolved into us, you know. Um, so, yeah, molecules to people. Is, is, is what they think, and so that's progression. Well, if that's how biology works, they would say, that's how history would work. And again, all of this comes out of the Enlightenment era of the late, 1800, or late 1700s and you know, early 1800s. And so progressive history, another easy drawing. It's just an arrow that goes up. That's how they, that's how they see uh, history. Now, very few people believe this anymore, okay? Why do very few people believe this? World War I, World War II, the Holocaust, the Cold War, multiple genocides, pandemic. Do I need to go on or can I stop with that, right? Things are not getting better. We've actually found more ways to kill each other. In fact, for every good thing we've invented, we've used it to either kill or preserve. But it's never just been neutral, right? There was, uh, when I was a teacher, um, and Jesse might be using the same thing, um, there was this letter from a Holocaust survivor given to the teachers saying that education, because we always pitched education as, it's a, as if it's a good thing. And this Holocaust survivor said it was educated nurses that were burning our babies. You know, it was educated doctors that were creating these, uh, these gas chambers. So education without um, humanity, without heart, is, it's really just a plague. Um, and so all that to say... By the time you get to the 20th century, nobody could take the idea of inevitable progress seriously. So other theories replaced it. Probably the most popular one was conflict history. It had its origin in the 1800s, wasn't popular then, but it became popular later. And this is really what communism's built off of. A guy named George Hegel came up with this idea. Hegel rhymes with bagel. I always tell people that so they remember it. And then Karl Marx took Hegel's idea and, and just like, infused economics into it, like everything's about economics, and then all of a sudden this supposedly explains history, right? And so this is called dialectical materialism. That's the technical term for conflict history. And the idea is essentially this. You have what's normal in a society. It's called the thesis. But then something rises up that's in opposition to it, which is called the antithesis. And I don't know if you've ever noticed, but antithesis, if you break it into its parts, is just antithesis. Okay, so you have the thesis, that which is normal, you have the antithesis, and then they battle it out. Who wins? Well, you know, traditionalists would say the thesis wins. The good guys always win, right? But actually what conflict theorists would say is no, nobody wins. What happens is you have a synthesis. 
that synthesis ends up being where there's some things of the thesis left over, but some of the challenges won. And so now you end up with this, this new situation that's a blend of the two. And after a couple generations, that becomes the new normal. And so that's now the thesis. And people forget that there was ever a thesis before it. Okay? So the synthesis becomes the new thesis. And what's going to rise up against it? Another antithesis. And then they're going to clash. And then eventually, you're going to have a new synthesis that becomes a new thesis and so on. Now, are there, is there some truth to this? Yeah. Think of the 1950s. Let's say 1950s American society where the expectation was you get married. It's man, wife, 2.5 kids, um, you know, and, and, and that's just how it is. You, you get a nice executive job. The woman's a stay-at-home wife. You wait until you're married to have conjugal relations. That's what was normal in the 50s. And when people kind of pushed against that, they were outcasts. Now, my guess is a lot of people pushed against it in secret, and nobody ever found out because a lot of people are hypocrites, but for the most part, that was the cultural expectation. Then you get the 1960s, free love, peace, mushrooms, man, you know, the hippies. They challenged that 50s thesis. Now, did the 1950 culture prevail? No, but did we become as crazy as the hippies wanted us to be? I mean, they wanted anarchy, no law, all that type of stuff that people would just run off and frolic in the forests without any government and everything would work fine and mushrooms won't really fry our brains. But so nobody's gone as far as the hippies. But what you do have is I think we're in the grand synthesis of this where you you have we haven't gone as far as them. But I'm telling you that 50 society is gone. Sexual promiscuity is the norm. It's what pushed on TV. Gender norms are almost completely rejected. Um, but at the same time, people understand that there's, there's benefit to marriage and family and the social stability that comes with it. So you kind of have this, uh, this, this synthesis, and it's been challenged with the transgender movement. That's the big challenge, the big antithesis to, I guess, what you could say is today's thesis. And man, it's even ripping feminism apart. That's why you can't even use the word feminism without saying, are we talking first wave, second wave, or third wave? And the third wave people can't stand the second wave people. The second wave feminists were the ones of the 60s and 70s. The third wave ones are the ones today. How many of you are familiar with the fact that uh, the author of Harry Potter, J.K. Rowling, who was a rising star of the feminists just 10 years ago, is now trying to be canceled by the new feminists because she's against the idea of a man being able to say he's a woman. Um, like she's like, that's going to ruin our sports. That's going to ruin um, really feminism. Feminism was a bit like, how could you have an all woman's college when some dude with a beard says, my name's Linda, and now you got to let him in the college, right? And so like classic feminists are like, this doesn't work. So now you got this big clash. And so there is truth to conflict history is what I want to say. It doesn't prove Marxism by any means. In fact, most of communism's predictions have fallen flat. But what I'm saying is there's truth to this. There's truth to the progressive thing. Some things have gotten better. There's truth to the cyclical that patterns do seem to repeat. But the ultimate thing behind it all is it is linear because we are in time and there is a God. There's no accident to society. We, like, we exist because God made us and things are moving somewhere. So you have to kind of assume there's truth to all these, but they're, they're being led and driven by linear history. That's how I would explain the, the theories. I think that's how it works best, okay? Conflict history, my drawing is going to seem convoluted, but hopefully it does make sense after that explanation. <laughs> no, a fourth grader did not write that. <laughs> Writing on a screen is harder than it looks, just to let you guys know. It really is. The screen's all wobbling. I don't know how David draws his little drawings on his iPad. But just in case you can't read my chicken scratch, thesis, antithesis, and then synthesis is what's coming next. And I don't know if you ever noticed, but all those words have thesis in it. It all comes from this. A lot of times we don't consider the morphology of words, but it's important. And so then it happens, the synthesis becomes the new thesis, and then the process just keeps repeating throughout history. And Marx had his way of explaining it, how things moved from an original type of uh, communalism um, to then uh, feudalism and, and, and eventually capitalism. And then he believes the final stage is communism. And he believes this process is how it's going to happen. But again, very few people hold to that now because it's just been proven wrong too many times. Now, I went crazy and drew this cycle three times. I'm going to skip it. 
you get the idea. Um, so those are some of the, 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 the theories I was mentioning. Now, some of the more modern theories that have been added on top of this are the determinists. The determinists more or less argue that there's something that determines what history is going to be. So geographical determinists say history really just comes down to the map. It comes down to uh, geography, topography, all that stuff. And so all the early civilizations, Mesopotamia, Egypt, India, where'd they all pop up around? Rivers, the big rivers. And so geography definitely plays a role, okay? But is geography the thing that actually moves history? Can you explain everything that happened in history based on a map? I don't think so. But you could explain a lot of what happens based on geography. Economic determinists, these are the Marxists. They say money or commerce is what drives people in society. Um, but if you study history carefully, a lot of revolts and movements, um, even though some do have economic causes, there's a lot that don't. There's a lot that don't. So to, economics is a factor, but it's foolish to say it's the only factor. Biographical determinists, these are people who say men make history, kings, poets, intellectuals, you know, and you may have learned history in a way where you're focusing on the big names of history. That kind of um, rolls with the biographical determinists. Um, and do they influence history? Absolutely. Absolutely. Einstein cracking E equals MC squared um, influenced what was going to happen next, the development of nuclear technology and all that. So individuals do move history, but it's not only individuals that move history. So again, you don't want to just reduce it to that. Um, now, obviously, as a Christian, I would be a theological determinist um, that God is the primary mover of history and people. But what I would say is he uses all these other things. He uses all these other things. And, and Christians aren't the only ones who hold this. Uh, Muslims do as well. But the idea is God directs history because he's sovereign. Prophecy confirms this. I mean, he declares the end from the beginning. Uh, I think in my last sermon, I started off with the fact that the book of Daniel more or less says eight or 483 years from the time um, Jerusalem's ordered to be rebuilt. You count 483 years and the Messiah will arrive. And we know that in the year 459, Artaxerxes I, a Persian emperor, gave that, that ruling to rebuild Jerusalem. And exactly 483 years later, Jesus showed up and got baptized by John the Baptist. That's undeniable fact. Only God can make that happen. So to me, that's proof right there of theological determinism. But to make that all happen, God used these other things. He used geography, economics, people, all that stuff, right? God's just the main mover. We all make, fact, we all make decisions based on these factors. Um, some people will not live in California because they're afraid of earthquakes. So, you know, geography had a role. Uh, but then others won't live in Kansas because they're afraid of tornadoes. So, and I would much rather my house shake over my head than a tornado just whisk me away. Um, so, yeah. And, and again, there's a lot of biblical examples of God using these factors. Like Ezekiel 38 prophesies a coalition of nations is going to invade Israel um, pretty close to the, the before Jesus returns. And um, it gives the motivations. They want to plunder Israel. Israel's going to have some, some sort of wealth that they want to steal from them. Um, you know, and so, of course, if you read dispensationalist newspapers and blogs, they'll tell you they just found big deposits of natural gas. They're going to be rich. That's what the Russians are going to go after. I don't think you have to go crazy like that. But the scripture does say it is going to be an economically motivated invasion. Um, you know, and so, again, I think theological determinism is the clear biblical position. And I think we should understand church history that way. Um, historiographical attitudes. There's different attitudes people have when it comes to history. Um, traditionalism is, I have never met a professional historian that's a traditionalist. I've met parents with only a high school education, not that that's a bad thing, but they're not professional historians, and they tend to be the traditionalists. And what I mean is they accept the standard or past narrative of history. So, you know, as a history teacher, I got parent complaints all the time. A lot of times from conservative parents, even though I'm conservative. Right. So I would say things like, you know, Russia wasn't really communist. They're like, what heresy? You're not American. I'm like, they were socialist with the goal of being communist. There's never been a communist country. And then I try to explain it. And then they're like, well, that's un-American. I'm like, this, it's the truth. Right. And so so the thing is, traditionalism is, is like anytime you question what you've been told. 
right, then you're unpatriotic or you're disloyal to the group. And it judges any new claim by how well it agrees with the traditional narrative. And I think that's always the wrong approach because whatever the party line is, somebody came up with that narrative and it's okay to question it. That narrative might be mostly true, but there might be some things that aren't true in it, okay? How many of you grew up hearing that Columbus, um, you know, they, they, he's the one who proved the world was round and everybody thought the world was flat and they thought they were gonna sail off the edge of it. That is baloney. That was all created in the late 1800s by our country, in a sense, as a tool of propaganda to, um, to really like make the origin of the discovery of America something that we could be proud of. But the fact is, people knew the earth was a sphere and round all the way back to 600 BC, okay? Isaiah directly prophesied it back in the 700s BC. Then a Greek um, philosopher calculated its circ circumference and he was only off by 3,000 miles, which is pretty stinking good if you think about it. And even in, in European history, almost everybody believed the world was round and it's so easy to prove it. That's why, that is why Columbus thought he could find a shortcut, okay? And that's why uh, a, a rich king and queen would fund it. But if you were to go to some people and say that, they'd be like, how dare you, <laughs> you know? Um, and, and listen, the, the point is you just, some of the traditional narratives aren't true. You may have heard that we dropped the atom bomb on Japan only to save American lives. Is that true? Well, if you say the word only, it's not. Uh, we already knew the Cold War was starting. We knew that Joseph Stalin was already doing uh, things against some of the agreements. And so a second mushroom cloud stopped him in his tracks. It slowed him down in Asia. Did we drop the first bomb to save American lives? You bet my yarmulke. Did we drop the second bomb to intimidate the Soviets? Absolutely, okay? Um, that's just, just the way it worked, but again, in certain areas, if you say that, how dare you, okay? Now, the opposite, I would say, problematic historiog historiographical attitude is revisionism. The revisionists are the people who absolutely reject the standard or past narrative in history, and they seek to displace it with a more cynical version. So everything was a fraud. America was founded just so we could have slaves. That's not true, but it was part of it, okay? It was part of it, but they'd say that's all of it. Okay, the 1619 uh, Project, is a, it's, it's a revisionist um, hack history. It really is. Okay, and there's a lot of historians who've already discredited some of their claims, but that's revisionism. And when I bring up that atom bomb example, so from 1945 roughly to 1960, people accepted the traditional one. Then a revisionist came out, Alperovitz, and he said we only dropped it to... Uh, um, intimidate the Soviets. We didn't care about American lives, right? And then people are like, eh, and that fired up the hippies and, and all that kind of stuff. But both are wrong. It's actually a combination of the two, okay? So you want to resist revisionism. You want to resist traditionalism. With the traditionalists, hey, if something's true, you want to believe it. But with the revisionists, if something seems like it's, like the evidence doesn't favor it, then ask the questions, pull that thread see where it leads you. It's not going to lead you to rejecting everything. If you're rejecting everything, then you're actually not pulling the thread in good faith. You have an agenda. Okay, revisionists have an agenda. Traditionalists have an agenda. That's why, again, the truth is usually found somewhere in between. Now, critical theory, this is what we are having to deal with all the time today. It's Marxism removed from economics and applied to what's called cultural hegemony. And all that means is like a society, it has its, its language, its customs, its economics, its politics, uh, pretty much its whole culture. And they say it's all arranged to benefit one group at the expense of another. So it is taking the Marxist idea and saying you have the haves and you have the have-nots. And the haves arrange their whole society to keep them as the haves and to keep everybody else as the have-nots. And so that's where you get the oppressor slash oppressed matrix um, where you're either oppressed or you're an oppressor. And if you're an oppressed person that sides with the oppressor, you're a token. You know, all that kind of stuff that, that, that you hear today. That's coming out of the critical mindset. And so then what they would say is history is not anything real in and of itself. History is a tool used by the powerful to keep control over the powerless. And so what you have to do is speak truth to the power, to overthrow the power, and put forth your own counter-narrative. So instead of history being history, you have the history of the powerful, and it needs to be challenged by a counter-narrative of the powerless until the powerless overthrow the powerful, okay? And, and that's pretty much the whole critical mindset 
Uh, they don't believe truth is objective. They think, honestly, even if their narrative they know factually isn't true, if it helps them overthrow the current power structure, then it's speaking truth to power and therefore it's okay. And, it, and if what you're saying is true, but they think it serves the, um, the power class, then they're thinking what you're saying is racist, even if it's true. You may have heard math is racist. Okay, that's coming out of this, that the scientific method um, is, is a white people tool. Well, no. I mean, okay, some Europeans came up with it, but the question is, if you apply the scientific method in China, in Africa, or Europe, will it work? Yes. So it's, it's like creation's method that was discovered by people. It's not something that's, that's, you know, white people only. Or you'll hear this where uh, some people say, well, you know, punctuality. The idea that you have to be on time places, that's, that's white supremacy. And so you scratch your head on some of this. You're like, really? And even like the, the Bill of Rights, like religious liberty, um, the Smithsonian had this big list. They took it down after people uh, called them out on it, but I made sure I screenshot it. So I'll always have it. They had this big list in the Smithsonian of what constitutes white, white supremacy, religious liberty, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, um, right to private property, they consider all that actually white supremacy. And you're like, well, wait a minute. Those are just Enlightenment principles that come from the social contract theories of the 1800s. It had nothing to do with, with white or whatever. These, these were political ideas. But again, critical theorists don't care. So I think critical theory is a, a big problem, but it is probably the most popular historiographical attitude on the market right now. Um, and again, its whole goal is to seek to subvert whatever is uh, the, the status quo. And by the way, that doesn't mean the status quo doesn't need to be changed. There are some things that if you look around any society that are wrong and need to be fixed. But they're not out to fix. They're out to completely obliterate and rearrange. And so I always tell people that you've got two different revolutions that happened 300 years ago or 250 years ago, actually, that make a good model. You've got the American Revolution and the French Revolution. What's the difference? The American Revolution um, looked at what was wrong and pretty much kept what was right and then made fixes on what was wrong, at least what they felt. Now they did it imperfectly. We still had slavery and you know women couldn't vote and have property and so not denying all that, but when you compare it to what we inherited from the British, we kept what was good and then made better, in my opinion, um, what wasn't working. So the American Revolution was kind of like a, it was a revolution, but it was conservative because it had a continuity with the past. The French Revolution tried to destroy the past. Oh, they have seven days in the week. We're going to have 10 days in the week. Um, you know, the, they changed the names of the months, the days. Um, oh, our past was religious. Well, now it's going to be atheist. Um, you know, and, and pretty much they just, the French Revolution imploded on itself. How many of you have heard of the Reign of Terror? Okay, the Reign of Terror where Robespierre, uh, you know, you have, it, the French Revolution is a very interesting, I guess you could say, lesson for us all that you had the smart intellectuals convince everybody that the current status quo needed to go. So they overthrew it, they killed a king, but then once they got the crowds riled up to do their, their bidding, eventually the crowds wanted to go more radical than the intellectuals wanted. And so then the crowds took over the revolution and started killing the original intellectuals. Um, and the same thing happened with the Russian Revolution. Started off with a bunch of intellectuals like Lenin, but then it gave way to Joseph Stalin, who was a street thug, and then he killed all the original revolutionaries and pretty much had his brand of street thugs um, pushing it afterwards. And that's the same thing that'll happen with critical theory if it has its way. It always leads to that. But anyhow, that's just my, uh, my soapbox on that. <laughs> <laughs> um, basic historiography continued. You know, the reality is no amount of, um, well, actually, I'm moving to a different subject here. So, again, I was saying on that last slide, um, you want to find yourself somewhere between traditionalism and revisionism, in my opinion. That's the healthy place to go. Um, now, the reality of this, I just want to state it up front. No amount of evidence will ever get you to 100% certainty on something happening in history other than what's in the Bible. And I say that as a matter of faith. If God inspired the scripture and he's giving us his perfect infinite revelation right then it's true it's objectively true it doesn't depend on us verifying it it is what it is but any history we try to discover we're never going to get to 100 percent certainty and i'm going to trip you out a little bit but you can't even be 100 percent sure abraham lincoln existed you might be like yes i can i've seen his picture okay he he hear me out none of you were alive in 1860 you just weren't okay 
None of you wrote the history books. None of you actually have touched Abraham Lincoln's uh, diary or, or anything like that. Now, am I trying to get you to doubt all history? No. What I'm trying to let you know is all the pictures, the speeches, the events, the books, all of those make it a super high, 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 high probability that everything you've heard about him for the most part is true and he really lived. But to get to 100%, you would have had to be able to go there and touch him and like feel his face. Oh, you are Abraham Lincoln. And then come back, right? That's the only way you're going to get to 100% certainty. So what I'm saying is like one of my professors when I was an undergrad history major said that it really falls on a scale of probability. You know, based on the evidence we have, you could say we're, we have a percentage of confidence that this event happened the way we think it did. The less evidence, the further the evidence is from the time, the lower that probability goes down. So just understand that historians, if they're honest, will be the least certain people out there when they're telling you what they think happened in the past. Now, the closer it is to us, especially now that we got video cameras and all that type of stuff, yeah, the more certain you could be. Um, but even to consider our own time, right? I was in my early 20s when 9-11 happened. Do we all agree on what happened on 9-11? We all see the same videos, yet there's some people, it was an inside job. And then you have other people, no, it wasn't an inside job. We just never conceived that an enemy would attack us like that. <laughs> I mean, we all saw the same footage. Some people were in New York when it happened, but it doesn't mean because they were there, they all interpret it the same. So 100% certainty when it comes to regular history, it's just you're, you're not going to get there, is my point. But as I said, when it comes to the Bible, we don't have that dilemma. So when we're studying church history, everything that I'm telling you is based on the best evidence we have. And really, like a lot of historians have studied it, debated it. And so the narrative you'll be getting is like on that scale of probability that most church historians think this is what went down. But it's always possible that 20 years from now, some new document will be discovered that's proven to be authentic. And it makes us kind of maybe revisit Augustine, right? Oh, we might have got Augustine wrong, you know, on one point. And so just understand that um, the history books written on church history right now are not the same as they were in the 1800s. Okay, I have a, a, a full volume of the Latin history of the West, church history of the West, in my library written in 1908, I think it was. And if the same thing were written now, it would not be written exactly the same. Just understand that more stuff is constantly getting discovered. So I want us to understand the limitations of the historian. Okay, we live in a different time. We speak a different language. We have a different culture from the people and places and events that we're going to be talking about. Okay, um, and then you, you might say, well, we go to the primary sources. That's true. But even the primary sources have their own biases, their own language, their own culture. So you might say, but I'm reading an eyewitness. But didn't I just give an example of many eyewitnesses of 9-11 not agreeing on what happened? So even if you have a guy there from the time telling you what they think happened, it doesn't mean it's 100% what happened. Okay, So you, you definitely have to understand the limitations of our historians today, of primary sources, definitely of the secondary sources, the things written by his, uh, historians. I remember when I took a, an American history class in college, our professor had us read two different books, one that was a normal American history book and one that was just a revisionist pile of garbage. Uh, but we had to read both. They covered the same period of time. And I'd be thinking, like, am I reading about the same country in these two books? Yet these guys are looking at the same evidence. But one is trying to push one narrative. The other is trying to push another one. And they're secondary sources. So just understand there's... there's uh, there's limitations, okay? Now, does this mean accurate history is impossible? No, there's, I guess you could say, built-in safeguards. You look at a lot of evidence, you have multi-layered analysis, and here's where I would say you, 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 this is what you need. You need a diversity of interpreters, okay? And I know that sounds like critical theory. It's not, it's just common sense, right? If everybody who's interpreting something is only in one echo chamber, and only looks at the world through one set of eyes, then you know, you're, you're not going to have as much um, accuracy. But when you have people from different areas with different viewpoints looking at the same evidence, doing the same kind of analysis, and they come to the same conclusions, you've now just safeguarded yourself from the idea that this is, this is a, more of a cultural interpretation. And so I think history is getting better because of that. What is bad is when people insert agendas into it, and that's what you want to, to watch out for. Uh, but good historical work, I mean, it's going to require the acknowledgement of these limitations, 
and um, and I think you're you're better off having different people um, from different areas dive into it. And church history is being blessed by this. Um, one of the best biographies I read on Augustine was written by uh, Justo Gonzalez, who was writing it from the perspective of a matizo. Um, and you'd think, okay, I mean, wh what does that have to do with this? Well, Augustine was half African and half Roman. And so he was kind of a, a mix between these two worlds. And he was the one that paved Europe forward for the next thousand years because he was neither the Roman world or the African world. He represented something new. And so Justo Gonzalez was able to say a lot of guys, you know, in Mexico and Cuba and stuff like that really could relate to Augustine. And I never thought of it that way, but the way he wrote his story, when I compared it to other biographies, I'm like, this explains a lot about Augustine's success. And so it was worth reading, definitely worth reading. And so that's what I'm saying. You know, getting different perspectives uh, definitely, definitely helps with that. Um, now, what I want to end with, because I'm not going to keep going. Um, I didn't get as far as I was wanting to because I talked too much. And um, you guys all knew better, but I always self-deceived. Um, but... I want to end with the recommended method for learning church history. So we get back to, to church history because I've been talking about history. The rest of this, I'll be talking about church history, okay? Um, but recommended method, if you want to learn church history, you have to ask yourself, what is your goal? Is your goal to be a learner or is your goal to be a writer? If you're going to be a writer, then your goal is to be a historian. And, and pretty much it's going to be different. But if you're just wanting to learn, okay, if you want to be on the level, then the first level is what you're doing right now. You take a course like this, okay? This course will give you an overview so you understand the main periods, the main people, generally what happened. That way you're not like completely a blank slate when it comes to church history. And then read some good uh, introductory books. I have a bunch in my office. I was planning on bringing them in today. I'll, I'll bring them in next week and, and just show you some of them. But, you know, they're thick books because they're covering 1,500 years. But it's their easy reads, and it gives you a good overview. It does not make you an expert, okay? Do you guys know what the word sophomore means? It means wise moron when you break it into the Greek, okay? Now, why does the word sophomore mean wise moron? Because what happens is we're not talking about high school. We're talking about college. Somebody comes out of high school. They go to college. When they're done with their freshman year, they act like they know everything. My parents are morons. My high school teachers are morons because they've had two semesters. And so then they start their second year of college, and the professor's like, here come the wise morons. I mean, they still don't know hardly anything, but they think they know a lot. At level one, you're a sophomore, you know, for lack of a better term, okay? Now, you're going to know more than the person who hasn't done the first level, but you're not a historian. And so don't go on Facebook or Twitter acting like you're a historian. You're just somebody who knows more about church history than the people who haven't done that. If you want to take it to the next level, the second level, then now that you got the big picture, you focus on an area. Maybe you're very interested in Charles Spurgeon, okay? And you want to know what his whole ministry in life was about because you've heard about him. And so you dive in. And then you realize, oh, there was this thing called the downgrade controversy. So now you dive into to really Baptist theology in England in that particular period of time of the 1800s. And so, yeah, you're taking a deep dive in one era, reading uh, books about Spurgeon, reading books about the controversies of the time. Uh, and now you know a little more. You're a little more expert about one part of church history. The third level is to then read the primary sources. Read Spurgeon himself. Don't read the guys who are telling you about Spurgeon. Go to the source. And then his enemies, go to their readings or what they wrote and read what they said, right? You go to the primary sources. That way you know the details and the thinking of the actual people that were there themselves. At that point, you could start talking like you're somebody, okay? But if you have not read any primary sources, you can't talk like you're, you're nobody, okay? And I'm saying that in the nicest, most loving way. It's just, you know, on social media, I deal with the wise morons every day. And it's just like, man, you don't even know what you are. Okay, now, let's say you want to take it to the next level. You want to be a historian. Well, first you have to get to that third level of learner. But now, once you're at the third level of learner, you get to the first level of the one who's going to write. You're continuing to read primary sources, reading a lot of them. So when I was working on my, my master's thesis for um, theology, it, it, my hermeneutics and ancient history. So I had to read a lot of, of, of all of it. I read probably 90% of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, I read 90% of the Pseudepigrapha. 
Um, there's so much stuff that was written in that time frame. I had to dive deep. I couldn't just read the books about it. Okay, I had to read the sources themselves and learn as much as I could about the setting. And then after that, once I think I understand, now I need to go to the people who've studied it a lot longer than me. So I've got the primaries down, but now it's the reverse order of that one. I'm going to go back to the secondary sources, but of the PhDs who are experts in this particular thing that, that I was studying. And so you want to look at the most up-to-date scholarly material on that subject of interest. And once you've read all that, then the third level is you, th you synthesize and you write. Now you're the next egghead that people are going to be reading your articles. They're going to be reading your books, right? And at that point, you know, you're a seasoned historian. Um, so again, this might pique your interest. You might, at the end of this course, you might be like, I really like church history, and I'm really interested in the Cappadocian fathers of the fourth century and how they were dealing with the, the heretics um, that were denying the Trinity back then. So then what's going to happen is you'll learn more about that, and maybe you might say, I'm going to go to school for that. And who knows, one day I might find your book on the shelf where you're explaining how the Cappadocian fathers really got it right and all the people pushing back today just don't know what they're talking about. And I'll buy your book because I happen to agree with that conclusion. So, uh, but yeah, so that's kind of, kind of how, this, how this works. And so the books that I've read and the courses that I've taken to be able to teach this course are the guys who've done that. Now, truth in advertising, I have a bachelor degree in history and a boatload of master's degrees in theology. So I'm not a church historian. Don't have my PhD in this, okay? So I'm not approaching this from the standpoint of a third-level writer, okay? I am approaching it from the point of somebody who's learned and made it to the third level and probably even the second level for writing. Just haven't synthesized anything uh, myself, particularly in church history. So do I know enough to teach it? Yeah. Would a seminary let somebody at my level teach an introductory church class, church history class? Yes. Even... Uh, a university would let somebody with a master's degree before the PhD teach the entry level classes. So you're still getting what you would get um, had you gone to seminary and had a, a professor teach you. Um, and that's pretty much where I'm going to stop today. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to kill the recording. And then if anybody has any questions, I'll take them for 10 minutes. So let me hit stop on this.